everybody. Um, welcome. We're so excited to have you here today. My name is Chelsea Bell. I run events and marketing for Gordon's Wine. Um, and we're really excited to have Guy Davies here, who's our Bordeaux specialist from Gordo's Wine, uh, sorry, from Gordon's Wine, in um, addition to having Charlie Griffith here, who is the president of Vigilant um, out of Dover, New Hampshire. In Gordon's Wine, we're based out of Waltham, Massachusetts, but with locations all around the Boston area. We're going to be engaging today in a conversation all about um, uh, having and collecting Bordeaux as a value investment. And Guy and Charlie are going to engage in a kind of fun free-flowing conversation about this. And we definitely encourage for you to participate. Um, the best way to participate in this event is to type in your questions via the chat. And then we'll leave some time to at the end of our discussion to let you guys ask questions to in person if you'd like as well. This should just be a really fun and informative um, seminar and a great way to learn a little bit more about some of the amazing Bordeaux wine offerings that Gordon has and some of the amazing cellar offerings that Vigilant has. So I think it will be a really fun conversation. I'll maybe start off by just um, letting Guy maybe start a little bit about his background in Bordeaux and um, kind of get the party started. Sure. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, and if I can give just a sort of brief overview of my, uh, my sort of life with, with Bordeaux, it kind of started in, in many ways as a, as a child in that my father is a big lover of wines of, of Bordeaux. I grew up as probably most of you can already hear, I, I'm British, I grew up in the Southeast of England in Sussex. Um, as a result of my, my dad's interest, we spent a lot of time when I was a kid traveling around wine regions of France, um, something that at the time I didn't really appreciate. Um, in hindsight, obviously a lot of it sort of, you know, seeped in by, by osmosis because I ended up really, really interested in this stuff. Um, as I became a, I suppose in my, uh, well, younger than a lot of people might think was re uh, reasonable. I probably started trying some of these wines with um, with he and my and my uncle, who are both big uh, big lovers and, and collectors of, of Bordeaux. Um, mainly, pretty sort of reasonably priced everyday Bordeaux, but they would um, they would age it for a long time in their cellars. Um, which made it rather wonderful, which kind of links in with the subject of, uh, of today's, you know, of, of what, we're what we're talking about today, particularly. Um, I then studied uh, law at university, graduated um, into the middle of the EU recession in 2008, um, not wanting to go straight on and work in law, um, but instead looking for something to sort of do for a couple of years while I was living in London. What I found, obviously linking back to my early exposure to the wines, not just of Bordeaux, but of most of France, I found myself working for a wine merchant in London. Um, after a few years then, I was getting really interested in this as a career. And then I moved to Berry Brothers in Rudd, who are, I think, the world's oldest wine merchant, very, very well-known sort of establishment in the, in the heart of London, where we sold to, uh, to the royal family, to, you know, lots and lots of celebrities, and, um, uh, but also obviously just, you know, wine lovers all over the UK and all over the world. Um, I then, in 2016, my wife happens to be from Massachusetts, I, uh, she got a job back in Boston and we moved over here. I did some research into the, uh, into the sort of wine scene in Massachusetts and found um, really that Gordon's were the most sort of exciting retail outlet that I could find with a sort of real focus on selling great wine at scale. Um, having a really ambitious sort of fine wine program. Um, and they were a company that sold a lot, a lot of uh, Burgundy at the time and not so much Bordeaux. 
Uh, and I found through my background, my childhood, and just having worked in, uh, in the wine trade in London where Bordeaux is so dominant, that I sort of found I was a, a Bordeaux specialist once I was in Massachusetts, which is not something I necessarily would have called myself in London. It's a bit like if someone worked in the wine trade in, in California, I think even if you didn't consider yourself an expert on the wines of Napa, if you moved to London, you would be because you'd had just so much exposure to them. Um, so that's a kind of potted history of, uh, of, of me and Bordeaux. I now run the Bordeaux program for, for Gordon's, um, which means I buy any bottle of Bordeaux that goes through any of our stores or through our email offerings or on the website. Um, I buy, I go there. It would be at least once a year. I haven't gone for the last couple of years because of COVID, but I will touch wood be going back in three weeks to taste the 2021 vintage in barrel. And I've been tasting the uh, barrel samples of the new vintage since the 2009 vintage. So I've been doing that for just over a decade every year now. And uh, I think that brings us to uh, brings us to here we are today. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Kai. Charlie, do you want to maybe give a little bit about your background and your, your time um, founding Vigilant? Sure. Um... So I got into the wine storage business uh, sort of by accident. Um, I, uh, in a previous life, you know, was a marketing person in uh, actually the food business way back in the day. And um, I started my own company in 1995, manufacturing <clears throat> electronically controlled humidors to fill that need, which uh, timing was pretty good. And um, back in 95, there was a mini cigar boom going on. So uh, we were fortunate enough to, you know, build the company based on that and expand it into all sorts of <clears throat> different things, including retail, uh, commercial. We still do a lot of commercial um, cigar storage work. We just did a 500 cigar locker job for the Ritz in St. Louis. We still do a lot of that. Um, but we, back in 99 and 2000, we, we felt like we needed to branch out um, and so we thought um, getting into wine storage was an opportunity for us, that there was a void in the market for high quality uh, products in that area. So we, uh, we began the journey in, of wine storage in, in, uh, right in January of 2000, which is now <clears throat> just over 22 uh, years ago. And um, it's been an interesting ride. I've always been somebody, I've, I've been in, interested and obsessed with wood since I was a little kid. Um, and so I'm fortunate enough to be doing something that I, you know, in an area that I, I love doing and working with wood and also <clears throat> being able to create things that, um, that are functional, not just something that looks good, but that, uh, that helps people. One of our uh, mottos is protecting your passions, whether it's cigars, uh, or wine or other things, which um, we've done. And um, so I've become uh, through necessity and through passion, really interested in how, um, how wine is best stored, how wine is best displayed. Those two things are not always congruent. And so sometimes there are compromises that need to be made in terms of um, you know, what wine is, is, uh, is being stored and shown where. Um, in different environments. So whether that's a home wine cellar, uh, whether it's a home wine cabinet or series of cabinets, which we do um, both for residential and retail um, and um, getting people, helping people figure out what based on their lifestyle, the wine they drink, um, their needs, how much wine they drink, how much wine they wanna buy and store working with people to help them solve those, uh, solve those problems, or at least be a part, a part of that. So through that, um, those experiences, I've learned, you know, a lot about, uh, general wine storage. I'm not certainly no expert, um, you know, on Bordeaux. So it's, this is going to be educational for me as well. I'm really happy to, to be here to learn more about that. And then to, um, to weigh in on, um, on some of the aspects of the storage and, I know that um, <clears throat> before we got live, we were, Guy and Chelsea and I were chatting about <clears throat> just general business and things and how 
COVID has really um, had a long-term effect on things like we all know supply chains and the availability of things. And um, I know wine has uh, certainly not been immune to that. Um, and uh, while it's not Bordeaux, I, I know people have um, read and heard about a lot of the wildfires and a lot of the climate change issues going on all over the world, really. Um, I'm a little more tuned into what, uh, what's happened out in California um, and some of the effects that, that climate change and some of the, and forest fires and things like that have had on, on wine, you know, on, um, on wineries and on grapes and on things like that. So I'm just uh, happy to be here. I um, uh, hope to learn a little something and at the same time, lend some, lend some value to this discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, Guy, I guess I'll come to you and ask. So when we were originally thinking and brainstorming this topic, Celery Bordeaux as a value investment, do you want to maybe under, um, do you want to maybe explain a little better what that concept kind of came from and, and explain it a little bit more fully to the sure. audience? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things to touch on there is that you can talk about a value investment in two very different ways with, with Bordeaux. With wine in general, but I think Bordeaux is a specific, you know, a particularly uh, clear example of when I mentioned that I would, um, I would drink wines that were generally in inexpensive wines that my father and my uncle had said, um, the experience I got there was how wonderful the, you know, a smartly chosen, but frankly, you know, inexpensive wine can become that it, it properly aged, stored in the right conditions, um, can become something spectacular. You know, and if we're talking about the sort of value investment, we're not talking about something there that you're going to retire off, um, but we are talking about something that's going to give you an experience at a price point that that you know wouldn't be possible just going to a store and, and, and buying a bottle of wine. You're not going to be, be able to capture that experience of, you know, they, they would have wines that were the equivalent now, you know, the equivalent bottles now would sell for, you know, $15, $20 or whatever. So just sort of fairly ordinary stuff off the shelf, but bought in the right vintages, the right producers, um, were really, really special at, you know, 25, 30 years of age. Um, and I think that's, I, I still find that really exciting personally. There's obviously another way of looking at it, which is you're obviously talking about a very different ball game if you're talking about the top of the market. Um, there, I mean, if you're really talking about actual investment, as in what the, what, you know, the value and the resale value does i mean having having provenance to sell um old fine bottles of wine proper storage is just absolutely crucial you know anything that we broker anything that we sell um we always want to know where it came from and it will always always make a difference to the price um it's obviously a little bit different it's interesting coming from the uk to the american market where in the UK, um, there's the system of bonded storage where people tend to keep their collections in sort of tax-free professional warehouses um, until they want to remove them and, and keep them and have them to drink. Um, at least that's the case for anything anybody thinks they might want to sell because that system doesn't exist in the States. In a way, it's even more important to have your own, you know, to, to have your own storage conditions. Uh, unless, of course, you're paying to store the wine somewhere else, in which case your storage charges um, that you're going to be paying on any uh, on any case of wine will pretty rapidly eat up an awful lot of um, an awful lot of you know otherwise profit that you would that you you would make um, selling a mature bottle of wine. Um, I think that. You know, the economics of, of wine as an actual investment are, are complicated. And it's something, what I always say about it whenever anyone asks is that I think if someone was coming to me with investment as the primary goal, I would say, frankly, don't do it. Um, 
and this I say that as someone whose whose job it has been for many years to uh, convince people to buy sort of investment level Bordeaux. Um, but I think if you truly want to get, you know, you, you want to get a sharp, smart, efficient return on your money, there are many more, many easier ways of doing it. However, if you happen to really, really like wine, really, really like mature wine, like the experience of, of wine, uh, uh, in, uh, of seeing a wine mature from, from a young wine to, a, to an older wine, then in many senses, you often can't lose as an investment, as a sort of side effect, because smartly bought, you know, smartly bought wines will appreciate in value. Um, again, it gets complicated if you factor in all your storage costs or the cost of building a cellar or whatever it might be. But it, it, I, I can tell you with confidence that if you, um, if you buy the right wines when they're young, age them until they're old, they will be worth you know, significantly more than when you bought them for, than what you bought them for. Guy, could you give, um, to maybe a little bit of an example from kind of how you, so now I think you have around a thousand bottles or so that you've collected, is that correct? That's probably, probably about right. Yeah, I, I, I lose track slightly. <laughs> yeah, probably between 500 and a thousand somewhere, I think. Yeah. When you first started collecting, can you maybe chat a little bit about like what you were looking for and to kind of um, maybe break down a little bit to um, kind of what different types of Bordeaux, like Chateau, you have in your collection from like kind of the everyday price points, the first rows, everything in between. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, I guess in in many ways it hasn't changed a lot. But what what has changed, I suppose, is in the UK the way people buy and sell wine is different because. Again, the bonded tissue system, which I mentioned before, but just in case if, if for anyone that's not familiar with it, the way it works is that um, when you buy a wine from a sort of fine wine merchant in the UK, if you buy it in bond, it means that it will be stored in a bonded warehouse, which is sort of overseen or monitored by the tax authorities in some, you know, in some form has to be run in a certain, in a certain way. And you don't pay VAT tax on those, which is 20% tax, which you'd have to pay on the wine if you were going to uh, have it delivered to your house. Um, you can then age the wine in your bonded warehouse, paying your storage charges year after year. Um, and then you pay the VAT when you want to eventually remove the wine. And the nice thing about that is that you pay the VAT based on the purchase price rather than the value at the time. So if you've had, you know, 15 years of value appreciation in the wine, you end up effectively paying less, fairly significantly less tax on it. Sort of, it's an unusual advantage of inflation being your, being your friend um, when it comes to tax and, and things like that. Um, that means that in the UK, there's quite a healthy market of um, people buying and selling wines that remain in, in storage. Um, there are broking exchanges where people list what they've got for sale. It's in a bonded warehouse. You might have the same case of wine, which has transferred ownership 10 different times and actually never, um, never moved anywhere. It's just had 10 different owners and, and it's, you know, it's just a paperwork change. Um, that meant that really at the time, because I had good access to that, I was interested in buying um, uh, buying older wines, buying things that were closer to being ready to drink. Um, and that went from, you know, lower end wine sort of, I'm a huge fan of buying wines, as I've sort of already explained with the experience I've, I've had, buying wines that aren't the sort of blue chip wines that people really, really think are the ones sort of destined to age for decades. If I can find, you know, a case of a good producer's Cote de Rhone or a sort of, um, you know, a Bourgogne Rouge or something like that with a good few years on it from a really smart producer, I think that, that was the stuff I initially started targeting. As I've grown in the, you know, I've been in the trade longer, I've also, I've sort of established more of a system now because I've got 
again, I don't know, maybe seven, 800 bottles or something like that. I now have a system where I can sort of backfill so I can buy, I've got all the wines that are, get, that are getting older and I can buy the, what I think are the best value releases every year as futures or whatever it might be. And I'm just sort of loading the front of the cellar so I can take things off the back. And that's really the, the goal that I, I had when I started collecting wine. And I'm, I'm sort of just approaching that, that point now where that's a sort of, you know, self, uh, I think you know what I mean. Yeah, it keeps feeding itself. You know? That makes sense. Um, we have a couple questions so far, so I'm gonna post them to you both. Mm -hmm. Um, the first question is from Jeffrey. Um, the question is, is there a difference in resale value or ability if you store in a private um, versus a professional storage facility such as our Gordon mm -hmm. private storage in Newton? Um, I mean, I think, again, it's, it's, inter it's, it's another interesting difference between the UK and the US because I think in the UK, the answer to that would be yes, because you've got everybody wants to buy and sell bonded wines. In the US, my experience where the bonded uh, wine isn't an issue, what people that are buying the wine really, they want to trust what the situation is, right? So in some senses, you haven't actually got an enormous difference because, you know, professional storage in the US is still, um, is still open, as in the customer could take wines in, put them out, you could have something that you'd stored in your kitchen underneath the, you know, next to a radiator for 20 years and then put it in professional storage for a year and then say, hey, look, I've had this in professional storage. Things don't really, for the most part in the US, have a sort of provable paper trail of, of, of storage provenance and history like they do in the UK. Um, so I think as someone that would be buying wines from an individual, what I really want to do, it would be to talk to the person and get an understanding. When did they buy these wines? Where have they been? If they've been in a cellar, we you know, ideally want to see the cellar and see the conditions. Is it temperature controlled? And there is an element of, of, of trust involved in it where we've got to, um, you know, assess how well we think these things have been stored. And that's the case whether or not they've been in professional storage or whether they've been in someone's private storage. So the reality is, if you've got a perfect, you know, underground, temperature controlled, you know, humidity controlled, everything pristine, that's not really going to be any different to us than a professional, uh, professional storage uh, place. Thank you. I have a question. Guy, is there anything that a private uh, person with a seller, as you mentioned, that's, uh, you know, temperature controlled, humidity controlled, uh, you know, it's away from vibration, UV light, um, and all the things that we know about. Is there an, anything that they can do um, along the way to build their case for Providence other than trust? I mean, obviously, they're, I mean, at a really high level, right? If you're talking about, I think this could be a, a fairly big question if you're talking about a cellar full of first growth of Chateau Petrus of you know really a kind of like something that's of the level that's going to be like a single cellar sale at Sotheby's or Christie's or something like that um, I think for that kind of thing there's going to be some pretty serious questions and the more you can prove about you know keeping your receipts of when you bought the wine if you've got things I mean I would suppose mm, things that would monitor the temperature in your cellar. So you can show, you can show look, this cellar keeps a, a perfect temperature year round or whatever. Um, but even then in the US, you're still gonna have that element of trust where it's like, yeah, theoretically, we know the wine came from that, from that cellar, but I don't know about you, but I don't know of a way where you can have a sort of cast iron provable, I can show to a retailer 100% of these wines have been in temperature control since the, um, uh, since the day they've been, uh, you know, since the day they were bought. We, we do have some customers who have invested in um, usually independent of the controls for the, the um, cooling and humidification system who invested in essentially electronic data loggers mm -hmm. um, that 
take temperature and humidity readings automatically and log it into uh, a program like a CSV file and then date stamp it. Mm. Um, and so that can, that can cover again, it, uh, you know, at least again, there's always trust involved, but that can cover the seller part of it. And I think if you combine that with, with your receipts, mm. because that's the point at which you got the wine and you can prove that, <clears throat> um, I would think that would, I know customers that just do it because they, A, they're tracking it anyway, because they want to make sure that everything's going well in their cellar. And B, there are customers who are using that to, to es establish providence at least a little bit more significantly than just trust. I would agree that's certainly a way of, as you say, that that does essentially guarantee the, the quality of a, um, of a seller. Again, there's an element of trust of whether or not those wines have always been in that cellar beyond getting really carried away, which I think is theoretically possible. You can get individual things that would monitor individual bottles. Yeah. Um, I know those exist because people use them for shipping, but frankly, the reality of you know doing something like that for, for bottles over 20 years or something would probably be a bit you know yeah. much. I have a, another question to pose to you all um, from George. George says, I'm a new collector and my new cellar is being installed. It has um, 500 bottles. Overall, he loves red wine and he would love to know some things that would be good to buy and store for the next few years. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously, yeah, that's, that's obviously a big question. And the, 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 the real honest answer is that I'd like to, to talk to you because I'd like to get more of an understanding about exactly what sorts of things you you like um and i'd be very happy i'm sure we can get your details somehow <laughs> somehow um so uh we'll, we'll you know we'll find a way to have a, a proper chat after this is gone because it's going to be very subjective but you know i'll take the opportunity to answer it in as objective a way as i possibly can um which is I think that one of the most important things to do when you're thinking about cellaring wines, and this seems like the most blindingly obvious thing to do, but strangely, a lot of people don't do it, is make sure you're buying wines that you like. And what I mean by that is a lot of people get into the idea of buying certain wines because they're well-reviewed. They see something, they see a critic giving it, you know, I see this gets 97 points or whatever. You end up with a cellar full of stuff. I know people that end up with thousands of dollars, you know, sorry, thousands of bottles of wine. And then, um, uh, you know, 15, 20 years later, realize actually they don't really like much of the wine that they've got that their cellar is full of. And what I think is absolutely critical is to make sure you're tasting the stuff. People are very, very precious about drinking windows sometimes. And they buy a wine and they say this wine shouldn't be drunk for 15 years. And that's all very well and good if you're certain, you know, you already know this producer, you know, you like what aged examples of this are like, then uh, absolutely, you know, get, get stuck in and buy those wines and, and tuck, them tuck them away for 15 years. But if it's something new, I so strongly encourage you to just make sure you're opening things. Um, and make sure if you like the wine when it's young, you're probably going to like it more when it's, um, you know, when it's old. Um, that's obviously not a golden rule that applies to 100% of wines because not everything is meant for is meant for aging. Um, that said, my own personal track record is of having experienced lots of very, 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 very wonderful old wines that weren't the sorts of wines that people necessarily would have recommended for aging. So you can get some, you know, some lovely uh, experiences by uh, going off the beaten path a bit, and getting a bit creative. I just, or maybe some of those producers. That I just, I, I just saw a sort of follow up pop up on there on the chat about how to, um, how to know whether one will age or not. I mean, there's a lot of it is about the track record of individual producers um, and regions, of course. Some regions like Bordeaux does lend itself well to aging. Um, 
it's pretty full bodied, it's got tannins, it's got structure, it's got acidity. All those things are things that make a wine more, um, more ready to age. It's, very, it's a complicated question to ask if you're thinking about how do you sort of say you're tasting a wine blind and can you pick up that that is a wine that is meant for aging? Well, you kind of can by, if you think the wine is very good, but you think the wine has some things that need to improve. So for example, if everything, if the tannins feel too much or if the fruit feels too much, but you feel like you like the underlying materials, that's probably a sign of a wine that's going to age. But in practical terms, the most sensible thing to do is to talk to people that you're buying the wine from, to read critics' tasting notes who should be pretty good at pointing out when the sort of likely, you know, peak of a wine is going to be. Um, and you'll sort of find your way, uh, find your way that way. <coughs> I have another question here um, from Jeff. Um, Jeff says he has about... 600 bottles. He enjoys wines from Napa, the Willamette, and Sonoma, and doesn't know too much about Italian or French wines, mm -hmm. as he kind of feels like two French wines, um, as he knows them, are oh, could be too expensive. He's interested in knowing about a system that he can start to track his wines, um, and while he's not interested in collecting wine to invest in, he's looking for um, recommendations that are kind of like great for everyday drinking, um, but not necessarily to invest in. Yeah, I mean, certainly, again, on the individual recommendations thing, again, put us in, put us in touch and uh, we can have a proper conversation about that. Something I would say is that the perception that French and Italian wines are too expensive is something that I would, you know, I'm not saying that perception isn't out there, but I would say I vehemently, vehemently disagree with it, that I think some of the best value in the wine is uh, value in the world is um, is is from the classic regions of Europe um so yeah i can i can i can definitely find you some extremely extremely good value uh, options from france and italy particularly if you've got the um if if you've got a wine cellar if you've got the capability of aging stuff because that really unlocks the kind of thing you can buy i can show people you know bordeaux futures something we have a bordeaux futures campaign every year you know what in france and europe they call on premier but we sell the wines before they're before they're bottled. So that's what I'm going to be tasting: barrel samples of the, of the 2021s in Bordeaux in a few weeks, and then in the spring or the early summer, we'll be selling futures of them. Every year in the futures campaign, there are some outrageous values that are, you know, maybe 20 bucks, 25 bucks, 30 bucks, 35, and that sort of you know that sort of family. The reality is, you need to you do need to age them because Bordeaux futures are not ready to drink, you know, the moment they arrive. Um, so if you've got a, uh, if you've got a, if you've got a seller, I can, I can find you some, some serious, serious value. Great. Um, there's actually two questions here from Jeffrey. Um, I can ask you the second one again too, if, if you <laughs> go into them. Mm -hmm. but the first question is where, how do you resell wine into the gray market? through auction, through Gordon's, et cetera. So ask him how. And then his second question um, is, is it better to buy by the case um, rather than individual bottles? I'm a, I'm a huge, huge fan of buying wines by the case. Um, that's not necessarily just for, uh, for resale purposes. Um, there is some advantage in selling case quantities if you find yourself if you find yourself doing that. One of them is just scale, rather than it being a solid case. If you come to me and you say, I've got, you know, 115 different wines to sell, and it's all one bottle of this, two bottles of this, maybe three bottles of that. Frankly, it's that's logistically difficult to deal with, you know. Um, there's a lot of valuation you've got to find individual customers for those bottle of wines if you come and you've got 120 bottles in you know in 10 sealed full cases very easy to trade because we know what that wine is worth we can for we can send out an email offer and sell them you know sell them quickly um so cases are are easier to sell but that's not the fundamental reason why i'm 
big fan of buying wines by the case. So I think the reason that people have been buying wine by the case for you know generations and generations, if you go, if you talk to serious wine collectors, you'll you'll see cases rather than individual bottles for the most part, is because the joy, the pleasure that you can get out of really knowing a wine. Um, and you, I would argue you can't really know a wine without experiencing it in a few different situations. It's kind of like a friend when you first meet someone, you know, if, if, if you just meet them once, you're never going to have a real close connection with that person. But if you, you see them in lots of different scenarios, you, you have your wine with different meals, you have it on its own, you have it some when it's young, some when it, when it ages, the connection that you can build with a wine like that is extraordinary. And really that's when you can feel like these things that are in your cellar are, are old friends rather than just um, just individual bottles of wine. I think particularly if you've got one bottle of something very, very special, for the most part, people often end up never drinking it because you think, oh, I'm saving that for something special that never that actually never comes. And then you, you know, you just end up with these lots of individual bottles that you've never drunk. So I would say, I would strongly say bye bye the case and open up the wines when they're young so you can see what they see what they're like and, and watch them age. Um, and then there was a question to you where how um, how do you resell wine to the gray market through auction, Gordon, etc. Yeah. Um, I, I mean I would say if it's something you're interested in in doing if you're asking this question then then send us an email. Um, there are obviously different ways of doing it. There are some legal issues with it obviously in the US that need some slightly sort of careful navigating but um, it's not too difficult if you talk to the right person and we would be one of the right people to talk to so I would say please uh, uh, please talk to us if that's something you want to do um, and if you're if you're thinking about it hypothetically for something in five to ten years time know that there will be a way you can do it it will vary a bit according to the time and the exact sort of logistics of how you and the person buying it want to do it, but um, it's not it's not too tough. Awesome, Kate. Everything seems like it's kind of on a case by case basis. You know, it's not always a blanket blanket statement. So yeah. Like that. Um, George has a couple questions. Um, he asked, "How do we know which wines you age versus drinking it now?" And then. Um, if you want to age something, how long do you age it? Yeah, I mean, I think the one about, I, I, I think I sort of answered before yeah. the one about how you how you know which ones to age and not, and that's a sort of combination of your own. Obviously, the more you learn about it, the more you'll have your own opinion on it. At the start, I would maybe read notes and talk to experts about the individual wines and see what's recommended. Over time, you'll find you have your own you have your own taste and that's absolutely critical because I've been at many many wine tastings over the years where I've been pouring a, a wine for someone and you know one person says oh that that wine is much too old and then the next person tastes the wine and says oh it's very nice but it's much too young and it's it, there's no sort of neither of them are right or wrong it's just it's a subjective opinion right where some there are some wines that some people like uh one or two years of age and other people think don't peak until 15 or 20 years of age um and it's just something that you have to play around a bit with and see whether you're someone that likes the wines on the younger side or, or on the older side um sorry and then what was the second part of that question that's um the second part was so if you want to age something how long do you age it i know uh, it really varies by type but yeah it varies it varies too much to too much to say i will say that i've had you know, uh, extraordinary wines from Bordeaux from, you know, I had a couple of 1928s last year that had been stored well and were just absolutely on fire. So the right, um, with the right storage, there's almost realistically no limit to how long they will age for. Um, the question, the more important question is when you're going to like them most. And that's, that's sort of too subjective to give a, uh, a clear, one clear answer to. Guy, what's what's the best method for one to get access to the um, the futures tasting notes, and what's the process through that? I mean, uh, it, it's another one really where I would <laughs> I would say talk 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 to me 
Um, that's a lot of what, what we do. If you go to our, to our website, gordonswine.com, you can sign up to a mailing list for, for Bordeaux Futures, um, particularly during the campaign when the wines start getting, uh, start getting released. We'll have a, a banner up there saying, you know, Bordeaux 2021 or, or what have you. But if you contact anyone at Gordon's and say, I'm interested in Bordeaux Futures, we can get you on the, on the mailing list to get emails about them when they start coming out. And, you know, it's, it's a fun, the Bordeaux Futures campaign is, is, is fun. It's very, very, it's very hard work and long days for me because they start on, the wines start getting released when the French working day starts, which obviously is sort of three or four in the morning in US time. So I'm getting up at three or four in the morning and dealing with the people selling the wines in Bordeaux and trying to work out how much of this and how much of that we might want to do. And then as the day starts, I'm dealing with sending out offers to people and we're trying to sell the wines and trying to hopefully balance up the buying and the selling. So they're long days, but really fun. I've always enjoyed Bordeaux Futures a lot. I think it's really fun and a really fun way to buy wine. Um, Guy, I have another question here. It's a question from Martin and he asks, will the value of a case of wine be reduced if you open an OWC and drink one or two bottles? You know, I don't think so tremendously. Um, I think as long as you're, yeah, I, I remember hearing at some point from a collector, somebody told me this way back when they said, oh, I never buy things at auction that have, 11 bottles in because it means someone opened one of them and <laughs> they didn't like it and then wanted to sell it but actually I in general I don't think that's the case because um, most people that are going to be buying wines for auction or that have been brokered or whatever are going to know what what wine that is and whether or not it's something they like so um, you know if I say if somebody was selling, let's come up with an example, like 1996 Chateau Grand Prix Lacoste, a favourite Chateau of mine and a nice vintage from the 90s. If I see that someone's selling 11 bowls of that or 10 bowls of that or 12 bowls of that or 24 or whatever it is, I know that wine. I know, I know that I like it. I know that I want to buy it. Um, the fact whether or not somebody that owned it before had tried one and, and, and didn't like it, um, wouldn't bother me in the slightest um, so I wouldn't worry about it from that perspective there is a, as I mentioned earlier there is a there is a slight advantage to selling um, cases rather than individual loose bottles um, with really really high-end stuff if you're talking about cases of first growth a lot of people that are sort of collectors that really want you know pristine collections of stuff will pay a, a premium for some for a case that's literally unopened and sealed, has never been opened. So there is a slight advantage to, um, uh, to that. But at the same time, if you do that, then you never get to buy the wines that you, you drunk, which I think means you're missing uh, much, of the, much of the fun. Amazing. It looks like here there's a question from Roger. Um, this might be more geared towards you, Charlie, um, which is about asking um, some questions about the mechanics of storage. Are regular LED um, ceiling lights bad for wine? And if there is minor exposure to sunlight, um, I guess Roger has a window across the room from the cellar. Do the glass doors in the cellar require special protection? Um, that's a really good question. So I guess the easy answer is you don't want any light on your wine at all if you can, if you can help it. Um, LED lighting spectrum is a little bit better. Um, and you, you know, if you have a window outside the room and you have a glass door, we sell a lot of glass doors for wine cellars so people can see inside and enjoy it. And to Guy's point about drinking, there's also some joy in, in having a nice cellar um, and enjoying it that way. So uh, all the glass that we use in our doors has UV, uh, low E, low emissive uh, film on it, which does block out um, harmful UV rays, but not 100% of them. So a little what light washing in your wine cellar is not gonna do a problem. You definitely do not want direct sunlight of any nature uh, on the wine or on the labels. Um, so the best thing is, you know, if you're, if you're really serious about it, um, you just don't wanna have a lot of 
man-made light on in the room all the time and you don't want to have um, natural light coming in from outside but um, I just just one thing I thought about that I mean you know it's it's the most expensive part about I mean wine, building a wine cellar is expensive um, and the reason is is because it's every aspect of it is you know is not there's no one aspect that's inexpensive I mean if you're going to I mean, in the Northeast, upper Midwest, parts of California, you know, you can, you can build a wine cellar in your basement um, and you get a big, you get a big advantage of that, right? I mean, that's why wine cellars were built in, in the old world underground because they were naturally cool and um, moist and were a perfect place to store wine for a long period of time. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we do a lot of wine cellars in homes that don't have basements. Well, there's a lot more work involved to create a thermal envelope that can be cooled properly and, and keep the wine protected um, and in the conditions that it belongs, which, you know, we can get Guy's opinion on this. He knows more than I, but generally it's 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit at about 45 to 50% humidity you know, absence of things like vibration, which can shake solids out of wine. Um, and as someone asked, uh, keeping UV light away from it as well. Um, so you got to do that. And then you've got to, you know, for the most part, do a, um, a mechanical cooling system, which has energy bills associated with it and maintenance. I do have some customers that have very large wine cellars in the Northeast in the upper Midwest that they almost need no cooling because they were able to build them uh, in, a, in a basement that's substantially below grade and they insulated it very well. And they have a cooling system there to kick on, on uh, in the middle of the summer when it might get up a little bit warmer than, uh, than ideal. So, um, and I also have customers who have space, they have big houses, they've got empty parts of their basement and they don't want to spend a lot of money on aesthetics. They just want their wine taken care of so they build a very simple, you know, set of walls with a lot of insulation in it, put in a decent cooling system and they stack cases of wine in the concrete floor with, um, you know, when they do, when they buy their wine and um, then it's just a great way to be able to store your wine. And as Guy said, we don't, we don't have the, the bonded warehouses. Um, I know in the Boston area, and I know I've done a lot of work with, with wine storage facilities around New York City a um, couple of cities in Texas, up and down the Eastern seaboard. There are a lot, there's even more, there's more facilities than there have been in the past. I don't know how, um, how hard it is to get, to get space in these places, but we've done some work with them, helping them with storage um, and things like that. So um, that's a long way of answering a question about the UV light, but I hope, hope there was some other nuggets in there. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, another question, from Jeffrey, um, my goal is to buy wine I like by the case now and then sell it for maturity so that the bottles I sell pay for what I drink. Um, it's looking at Berlo, Bordeaux, and Burgundy. Uh, he asks, can I look at Premier or only Grand Cru? I assume that's um, for Burgundy. And then for Bordeaux, should he be looking at first, second, gross, or how far down should he go towards? Um, do you have any general suggestions, Guy? I would say that, you know, I. I... I hate the fact that I'm answering every question with, well, it, it, you know, it, it depends, but but that is sort of the, the reality of the situation that I would say it's a mistake to get too caught up in the classifications. Um, you know, if you take the Bordeaux classification, for example, where you've got the first growth, the seconds, the thirds, the fourths, the fifths, and the unclassified stuff, you know, there are all sorts of exceptions to that classification that, that mean you know, there are fifth growth, fifth growth that would be a better buy for the long term than certain second growth. There would be unclassified things that might be better than some third and fourth growth. You know, there's no classification at all on in Pomerol, uh, where some of the best, you know, most extraordinary wines in, in Bordeaux are, uh, are made. There isn't, there is no classification of any sort. Um, Burgundy so much is about producer rather than necessarily about whether something's from a Grand Cru or a Premier Cru vineyard, the person that made it is perhaps even more important than, than where, the, where the wine came from. So, you know, there's not a rule I can say, you know, only by second growth or more or only by Premier Cru's or whatever, nothing like that will, will work. 
What I would say is that historically, and I, I experienced this in the trade in London, there was a sort of prevailing wisdom at the time, which was that if you're wanting to buy wine for the purposes of investment, you should buy the blue chips, you should buy the first growths, you should be buying the tour and the feet and the and actually, I am. I even at the time disagreed with that, and I still disagree with that now. Um, I'm not saying that it's that it's you know that it's wrong to do that, but I do think that it's wrong to rule out um, more. Uh, you know, if I use the word ordinary, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but just you know, not the not the megastars. Um, I think you really got to look at. For me, what are people going to want in whenever you want to sell the stuff, right? So if you're looking at sort of a 15-year timeline, for example, you want to think what kinds of wines are, going to, are people going to be wanting to buy in 15 years' time. It's not that difficult because you can think, well, what 15 to 20-year-old wines do people want to buy now? And it's probably not going to change that much. If you look at... Um, so maybe it's a mistake to say it's not going to change that much because um, things are always changing to a certain extent with, with sort of trends and fashions. But if you look back and see the prices that you're going to pay for, you know, for good Premier or Grand Cru Burgundy that's 15 or 20 years of age, um, it's going to be a lot more expensive than the equivalent, um, the equivalent wines on release. Actually, Burgundy's a, Burgundy's a funny one. When I, I use the example of Burgundy, but... Because Burgundy, so so much of Burgundy is made in such small quantities. Um, prices have really, really been going up a lot with Burgundy over the um, over recent years. Um, some of the sort of top top names in Burgundy have got extraordinarily expensive. That's not to say there's not a lot of great value in Burgundy. What I would say, if I was buying for investment, I would focus on where the great value is rather than necessarily thinking I need to get the top of the top. Because then I think if you're doing, if you're doing the latter, you're sort of involving yourself in an investment market and the way that any market works really is that that market is in trouble if people are buying something for an inflated high price because they think that someone else will buy it off them for a more inflated high price in five years time or whenever it might be. So I think that's a sort of dangerous game to play. On the other hand, what is a very, very safe game to play is to buy a case of Burgundy or a case of Bordeaux that seems to be really good value. And then it's a pretty good bet that in 15 years time, somebody's going to want that good value case of wine when it's mature and, and ready to drink. And um, if for any reason they don't, and the value hasn't gone up, then you've just got lots of lovely wine to drink. <laughs> and that's really what I mean when I said at the start of this, that if you're going at wine as a hard-headed investment, it's maybe not the best thing best thing to do. But if you happen to love wine and you want to, exactly as Jeffrey says, this is what generations of people have been doing in the UK, buying about twice as much wine as you want, knowing that you're probably going to end up selling half of it and paying for much of the other half, you might end up not making much money on paper, but um, you'll have a very, very nice time doing it and you'll probably probably do all right. Thank you. Um, we have a, one other question too for Charlie from by George. Um, he asked, if we buy an exterior door for my inside wine cellar, do we just need a film on the door? I think that's um, most likely. I mean, it, the doors that we build are exterior grade. They just look like interior grade. So yeah, if you just, if you bought a door that, you know, an exterior grade door essentially means that it's insulated. Um, and if it has glass in it, that it's got insulated glass, which means multiple panels. Um, I'd get one that had um, a um, argon gas in the center of the panes. It, get, it increases your R value. Um, and get um, a lot of exterior doors. If you haven't already bought them, you can buy them with low E glass. Most of the glass being sold, like if you buy a skylight now, it has low emissive glass in it. Um, and then you can actually get the emissivity light 
filtering level. Um, there's a number for that. And you might want to get a high one to keep UV out because people in residential applications are going to not going to want super high um, emiss, uh, emissive glass because it's going to make the house darker. But in your case, for a wine cellar, it wouldn't be that way. So if you already have a door and it does have insulated glass, which if you have a conditioned wine cellar, you have to have insulated glass in it because you may end up with condensation issues with um, breaching the dew point on the center of the glass. Um, but you could get someone, there are companies out there that do light filtering films for glass and they could come in and apply uh, a, fil a film for you and you would shop that based on the color of it and the level of, um, of UV blockage, which is the E, the low E, the emissivity rate. Thank you, Charlie. Well, since we're um, nearing the end of our time, maybe we'll all have you each do as guy, maybe you'll start first, maybe just do like a little um, wrap up and summary. Before maybe you go, I'll just say that I'll um, make uh, by tomorrow an email introduction, um, just with some kind of follow up information for everybody that attended this event today about Gordon's Bordeaux program, I can introduce you to Guy. And then also too with Charlie and Vigilant, um, make like a little introduction to their team. If you have any questions about furthering your seller or, or building a seller, as um, definitely the combination of cellar building and wine is always very important. So we have both of those things covered today. Um, so you'll definitely be able to get to work with both teams. It seems like kind of from this conversation that um, kind of the fun of wine is the customization per person, depending on what your preference is. And the nice thing about both Vigilant and Gordon's is they have both great teams that can help you with very specific things, depending on your needs. So I'll let Guy um, maybe do a little wrap up right now and then let Charlie as well. Uh, I mean, I think Chelsea sort of touched on it there, but I think my main sort of wrap up point is that as you know, discussed in response to many different questions, the real key is how individual this stuff is, right? And I just really like to strongly take the opportunity to encourage any of you to please, please be in touch. Always happy to just talk about this stuff. It doesn't matter whether you're buying things or not. Um, just happy to talk wine. You know, no problem. If you got a cellar full of stuff and you want to ask me a couple of questions about it, happy to happy to talk. Um, I can be a little bit slow replying to emails, but I uh, I, get, I get to one. I get to one eventually. Um, other than that, yeah, I hope it's been hope it's been been helpful. Uh, enjoyed talking to you all, um, and thanks for having me. Yeah, I'd like to echo what good guy said too. I'm I'm happy to be a resource for anybody, um, regardless of whether you plan on buying anything, um, in terms of knowing, uh, asking questions about cellaring and um, trying to find maybe economical and accessible ways to have your own storage. We have a lot of really good information on our website um, about how to build a wine cellar, how to cellar, all the good things around that. Um, but if that isn't enough, the same thing um, through Chelsea, reach out to me. And um, I also know a lot of people, I don't, you know, everybody's probably from all over the place. I know we don't do any really site work. So I do know people that do, uh, do work, site work um, in helping people build wine cellars or wine cabinets or what have you. So don't hesitate to reach out and um, I'm in the same boat. I'm not going to be able to get back to you right that second, but I will, I will promise to get back to you. Awesome. Well, it's been so fun um, being with everyone. Oh, yeah. My name is Jeff. I'd like to make a couple of comments, if I could, please. Yeah. I first want to uh, thank Charlie for arranging this uh, event and also for yourself, Chelsea, as far as reaching out and Guy also to you. I'm a little bit surprised that right now it's about five o'clock and no one's got a wine glass going except me, maybe. <laughs> I'm so impressed. I saw your wine glass earlier and I was really jealous. Yeah, I poured myself just a, a little bit because I'm about to leave to the club tonight, Charlie, because there's a uh, veal chop. In the well, I'm, 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 I'm very jealous, too. I'm still in the office. That's why I don't have a glass. <laughs> Me, too. Here. I'm in the office. <laughs> I've got I've, I've to take my two-year-old to a swimming lesson in about 20 minutes. <laughs> that's my... Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. But I really appreciate everything that you uh, uh, gave to us today, Guy. And I can attest that Charlie... A couple of years ago, uh, built uh, a wine cellar, a beautiful wine cellar in my house in the basement. It's all temperature controlled, uh, maximum 
is 830 bottles. We've got about 550 to 600 right now. And uh, it's going to cost me a lot less money to come down to Newton as opposed to going out to California and hopping on a plane. So I look forward to coming down to see you and chatting with you with my wife, Diane, and uh, uh, we'll take a look at what you got. So I really appreciate it. I've got to run right now also, but yeah. thank you so very much. And Charlie, uh, thanks a lot. And I can hardly wait to see you on the golf course. I'd like to add my thanks as well, Charlie, for um, the vigilant organization that um, helped us design the wine cellar in our home in uh, East Tennessee. Our wine cellar is about 1,200 bottles and uh, you just did a uh, outstanding job for us. Um, our temperature control system is uh, absolutely perfect and uh, we thoroughly enjoy having, uh, uh, having this as a part of our home. And uh, we really enjoyed the invitation today to be a part of your uh, session. Guy and uh, Chelsea, thank you very much for uh, all of the insightful uh, uh, information that you've shared today. It's really uh, beneficial. One question that I would like to ask, you don't need to answer it now, but uh, maybe some feedback coming back. We didn't talk about secondary labels in Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. and I'd really like to know your perspective about that. Uh, I like St. Julian wine as an example, and Leo Villas Cas, I love but it's pretty expensive. So uh, I have a lot of Clos de Marquis and I really think it's uh, excellent as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly second wine's a very, very good way of buying for drinking. There's a slight, they vary a bit market to market. For some reason in Boston, the second wines don't seem to do very well as a sort of resale uh, value. Although actually Clos de Marquis is an interesting one, which isn't in fact a second, you know, it's, made by the same people that make Las Cas, but it's not, in fact, a second wine. And then you can go down another level with Lieber Las Cas with the Delon family to Chateau Pontet, which is, you know, half the price of Claude de Marquis even, and is a tremendous value. We're always selling Pontet because I, I love it. And you can, you know, we can get even vintages 10, 15 years old with, um, you know, for, I don't know, somewhere between sort of 30 and 60 bucks, depending on the age and the, the vintage. And it's uh, tremendous stuff. So I think you can go quite a long way down the ladder in Bordeaux and get stuff that's really good and really, um, uh, um, really ageable. The resale value of things varies a bit more from name to name, but yeah, for, for buying and drinking, top stuff. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody. And thank you so much, Jeff and David for that feedback. Um, it's just a pleasure being with you all today. I hope you all have an amazing rest of the evening and we look forward to hopefully getting to work with you all again soon. Thank you so yep. much. All right, everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Awesome, Charlie, thank you so much. It was awesome. Thank you, that was fun. It was really fun getting to work